Hello and welcome to another Royal Society publishing video podcast. We recently published a paper in one of our journals looking at the spread of infectious diseases using a novel method based on network theory. I'm here with one of its authors, Sebastian Funk, to learn a bit more. Firstly, what is network theory and how have you applied it to looking at the spread of infectious disease? Okay, so network theory has emerged in the last 10, 15 years or so through the study of, say, social networks, so people's connections and what we can learn from that. And or similarly, we know about computer networks or biological networks, cell networks. More generally or more abstractly, it's the study of a relationship between what we call nodes in the networks that are connected by edges. So it's more, you, could, you could view it more abstractly as just the relationship between some sort of entities that are connected in some way or the other, be it a social network of people or a computer network. So um, we've taken this, this kind of more abstract views to, to form a network of um, infectious disease outbreaks in that the nodes in our network are individual outbreaks and then we connect them, we form an edge between nodes if outbreaks are similar, in the sense that perhaps people had similar symptoms or there's a similar fatality rate, they occur in similar seasons or in similar places. There's been a lot of interest in network theory in recent years in studying community structure. So that's, again, if we take the, the example, the concrete example of a social network, it's trying to find these communities and um, these are, in the network sense, what you're talking about is parts of a network that are more closely connected within each other to the rest of the network. So that's hence the term community. So in, in, a, in a social network, there's this intuitive interpretation that it's a community of people that are tightly connected, but not so much connected to the rest of the network. So what we did is, is transport this idea of communities to our abstract network of outbreaks. And so if our nodes are outbreaks and then the edges tell you how similar different outbreaks are, then we would expect outbreaks of different diseases to form such communities in that they're quite similar to each other, but not so similar to the rest of the network. And that should show up in, in our network. That was the basic idea underlying this study. So what was involved in developing the model? What we did to develop the model is we, we collected um, outbreak reports. So we collected, we focused on Southeast Asia and outbreaks involving encephalitis. And this is because we were particularly interested in Nipah virus, which is a relatively recently emerged infectious disease that, that emerged in Southeast Asia. And so we collected 15 years worth of outbreak reports or studies on outbreaks and recorded the, the symptoms that were reported in these outbreak reports, the season in which they occurred, and the fatality rate in these different outbreaks. And, and so then that allowed us to form a network of these. So we collected 125 outbreaks. We formed the network of these outbreaks. There is something which is called Promet Mail, and it's a, it's a global um, platform where people can send an email about an outbreak occurring somewhere or some infectious disease report. So, and it, it collates and, and then sends it out to whoever subscribed to it. And the idea is that this can tell you something about trends somewhere or so it's just a, a dissemination platform for infectious disease reports. And in, in these reports, every once in a while, you, there's an email saying, we have an outbreak here somewhere. We don't know what it is. We haven't identified it yet. And on the basis of our network of outbreaks and where we would expect similar outbreaks of similar disease to cluster, we were wondering whether we could use that to perhaps add unidentified outbreak reports to this network and then see whether they would cluster similarly with some of the other outbreaks. You tested this model against outbreaks of 10 different diseases. What did you find out and how did you pick the diseases that you did? Okay, so testing with the 10 different diseases, we found that there's as we expected, there was clustering of uh, diseases in, in our networks, but it wasn't perfect. So some, di some diseases that are perhaps more different than others in terms of their symptoms, fatality ratio, seasonality, so on and so forth, they would form a more distinct cluster, whereas others that are perhaps, perhaps have less specific symptoms 
were less clearly identified. But interestingly, one, one disease that was identified quite well, or in fact, the one that we identified best, was Nipah virus. And so this then led us to think that perhaps this could be used as a tool in that if you have this network of infectious diseases somewhere, perhaps you can use this to identify a newly emerged disease because, it, because you have several outbreaks, uh, outbreak reports that cluster within each other, but not with the rest of the network. We selected these 10 infectious diseases because Southeast Asia is, there have been several instances of emerging infectious diseases from Southeast Asia recently, including Nipah virus. And we focused on encephalitis as it's an easily recognized symptom. So this, this seemed to us as a good basis to do this proof of principle study. What are the strengths and weaknesses of your model? Okay, so one strength of network theory or using networks is, in general is that it provides a powerful tool for visualization. So in our case, it allowed us to, to construct this network and then visualize it. And already without doing any, any analysis, you could, you could identify clusters in there and there was clearly some sort of structure in there. What we did in constructing the model from these reports of symptoms is we weighed each symptom differently. And we, we chose these symptom weights in order to maximize the clustering. So we try to find symptoms that would lead, that would distinguish diseases more. So we try to find these symptoms that are good at, at identifying different clusters in the network and, and distinguish between different diseases. And however, there's, there's no perfect set of symptom weights. And so perhaps some symptom is better at separating one disease from the rest of the network. Another symptom is better at, at, at separating another disease from the network. And so what we did is we created a whole ensemble of 200 such networks where we, each time we ran an optimization procedure with some element of randomization that would identify different symptoms that would then yield optimal modularity. And then we put all this together. So I think this, this may be one strength of our model in that we allow for multiple solutions to this problem of, of finding a set of symptom weights. So there's several shortcomings that I should mention here. And this is really just a proof of principle um, study. So first of all, of course, the model is only as good as the data that are reported. And in fact, when we, look at, when we looked at the unidentified reports, some of them that were later diagnosed to be something, our method failed because the data was incomplete or there was, it was reported during an ongoing outbreak. And there's all kinds of issues with data reported during an ongoing outbreak as regards um, death rates and so on and so forth. There's, there's sort of concrete issues there that are, that are very difficult to, to resolve. So, so that's the first thing. And then the other thing is that we assumed in choosing our 10 diseases, we, we assumed that every outbreak is one of those 10 diseases. And so some of them turned out to be something completely different. And then again, our method failed. Promet Mail has an, an element of expert commentary. So every mail that is being sent to Promet Mail is, is assessed by an expert in the field and then commented on. And I think our method could be a complement to that in that it provides some sort of assessment, but it, it cannot replace or it, it, it can only add to that. It, is, it cannot do what a human can do in perhaps, for example, saying it's actually it's something completely different or it's, it's, um, there's an additional factor that we should include. It's only as good as the factor that we include. It's only as good as the diseases we include. And if we omit something, then it will not be regarded in there. And similarly, a library test of a sample from an outbreak will give you usually a much clearer signal than what we do. And finally, how might this model be developed into a potential tool for assessing the spread of disease? In principle, I think, it could be developed into such a tool in that if we include perhaps larger areas or more diseases, then this could really be something. It would have to be developed in, into something that is readily available on the web or in some way or the other that someone just has to click a button and then it would visualize diseases in this, in this way that we do. I think in principle that's possible, but it would have to be we'd have to do much more testing and better validation for it to really make sure we are assessing the right thing. But then in principle, I think there's nothing that speaks against developing it into such a tool. 
Thank you very much and thank you for watching.